All right, everybody, welcome to the Sully Special Podcast, Episode 8. I am sitting here with my co-host, Weston Wickman, who's finally back, and today's guest, Master Luke Kumo. What's going on, Luke? <laughs> you can call me Master Luke. Um, some people say, oh, why are you a master? First of all, it's branding. You know, uh, in uh, martial arts, you have the idea of a master, a sensei. I'm not a black belt. I've been training since 1995. And, uh, you know, some people say I reached the, the highest level of competition. Uh, you know, I had some mixed success. But if you don't think I'm a master... Face me and find out. <laughs> What's the difference between a master and a sensei? <clears throat> well, you know, the master could be could be a master of anything. For me, I think of it as a uh, master of self. You know, to be good at martial arts or good at anything, you have to have focus. You have to have discipline. And only when you can really can have self-control, then you could potentially control somebody else in a fight. So, uh, you know, sensei is a Japanese word, means teacher. I like to use the English. So, uh, you know, I'm a health coach. Some people call me coach, but like I said, it's uh, more branding than anything. One word. Master Lukey, right? Like share. I won't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, um, I'm again super stoked that you came on. Um, the first time I ever um, heard of you was I started watching um, The Ultimate Fighter, um, and yeah. I didn't want to watch, you know, it out of order. So I started watching season one, season two, and season two was your first season, and I was like, holy shit, this guy is is a fucking character. <laughs> I mean, he is. You know, the first thing that happened was your bed, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, was on the top bunk. And then you took it off, threw it on the ground, and then you pointed it north because you wanted your head as the same way that the earth is rotating. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's see. Uh, they call it uh, to toroidal, meaning Taurus. It's a. Uh, if you could imagine a donut where it's energy and then the energy is coming out, but it's also going in um, the black hole in the center of the universe supposedly is um, a Taurus and uh, our red blood cells, it's not really cells, but you know, the erythrocytes, they're this shape where it's, thick on the outside, thin in the middle. And then the idea is that the energy of the earth is Taurus. So you have the, uh, the North Pole and then the South Pole. And so the idea is comes from, uh, from Chinese, you know, Qi, the idea of Qi, which um, is in, in a, Many different cultures. They have Vril in Germany. They have, uh, what's the one in India? Uh, begins with a P, I think. But the idea is that you have energy that animates us. And when you put your head or you sleep to the north, it just makes things flow. There was... Uh, uh, a meeting we had when we got there, they had to take everything that was branded and they either had to Greek it, meaning they went over with a Sharpie or they just made us, you know, leave it. Nothing could have a brand because it's on cable TV. Mm -hmm. And the only books we were allowed was religious, like the Bible. So I had a meeting with the producers. I said, well, this is my religion. My religion is health. And so I was allowed to have two books. And one of them was called Prescription for Nutritional Healing. The other one was this book, 
uh, by Dr. Yang Jwing Ming. And I forgot the name of it, but it's all about chi and uh, it's about qigong, uh, essence of qigong, I think. Is that where you but, learned all that stuff is reading books and stuff like that? Or did you have someone teach that stuff to you? Well, to be honest, uh, Weston, I'm not a good reader. I skimmed through it. Uh, my first martial art was Kung Fu. And the reason I got into Kung Fu is because when I was 15 years old, my mom put me uh, onto Bruce Lee. She made me sit down and watch Enter the Dragon. And I was like, oh, what's this old movie? You know, no superheroes. But I watched it. I was like, wow, you know, I got to do this now. So this is before the internet. Somehow I thought that Bruce Lee did Kung Fu, which he technically started with Kung Fu. Gotcha. Uh, although, you know, he created his own style. But uh, well, went into the Yelp pages and I found a Kung Fu school nearby. Chan Tai San Kung Fu Center. Chan Tai Sam was one of the legendary 10 tigers of the late 1800s and early 1900s when China was just getting westernized. There's a couple of movies about it called Once Upon a Time in China with Jet Li. That period of time when everybody was Kung Fu fighting. <laughs> so Chan Tai San, he was, a, I believe, a monk and a master of Choi Le Fat and Lama Pai, two Southern styles. And he came to America. He had an ax wound in his head, a scar in his head from an ax. Um, you know, you don't have any videotape of those days, but, you know, he was one of the 10 tigers, these legendary warriors of hand fighting. And when he came to America, he had Western students. And my teacher was one of the only people who, they had this uh, ceremony where you get a key to the, the sea, they call him Sifu, instead of sensei, it's Chinese, Sifu was, master. It, was all of this in New York where this took place? Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you have a big uh, Asian population in New York City, and then in the outskirts, you have Queens, and then after Queens, you have Long Island, which is where I'm from. Okay. So my teacher, he got a key after however long period of dedicated training, he got a key to Chan Tai San's home, meaning he could come 24 hours a day to come train. You know, these are... Uh, borderline old days of martial arts where it wasn't really a hobby. It was, you know, a way of life. Now it kind of became commercialized a little bit. So you could do it on the weekends. You could do it after work. But Chan Tai San, he was a monk. So this is what he did. But the thing was, when you open that key, you had to be, you know, you had to do, give it your everything. And that's why only a certain amount of people got that key. My teacher name was Sifu Mike Perella. He's uh, on YouTube sticking his fingers through a watermelon. And it was a special type of training. It started with finger push-ups. You got um, handstands on the wall on your fingertips. And the idea was that you could puncture somebody with your fingers. You know, they're not fighting for points or submissions. Supposedly the, the dark side of the training, you know, you have your benevolent monks and you have your evil, you know, the, the evil masters. They would go under the cover of night and practice on animals like cows. But Holy he, shit. Uh, my teacher wanted to be able to 
rip somebody's throat out with his hands. But he also wanted to be the kung fu version of Tiger Shulman. You guys heard of Tiger Shulman out there? I've never heard of Tiger Shulman. No. <clears throat> it's a uh, one of the biggest franchises, mostly East Coast of the United States. One of the biggest franchises. He started out in Kyokushin okay. Karate, and he uh, became a franchise. It was called Tiger Shulman's Karate. Now it's Tiger Shulman's MMA. Guys like uh, who's the dude with the green hair in the UFC? Uh, Sean O'Malley. He's got multicolored hair. You go to know. Uh, go to know. Um, possibly. Um, there's another one. I can't think of his name. Um, and then the jacked guy who went to Bellator. Nisam. No, not Nisam Levy. Um, there's a couple of guys. Yeah. They they have such a uh, a large pool of students to pull from because they have a lot of schools and thousands of students and they have their own championships. So anybody who fights out of Tiger Shulman's as much of a reputation as they get for being a McDojo, they always have strong fighters because it's just the process of elimination. So anybody who represents them in a fight, they're, they're coming up through thousands of students distilled down, you know, to their people that they send to the big stage. They have a couple of guys in the UFC. It was that yeah. Mo- Moitino guy who Sean O'Malley beat, right? The guy who just kept coming at Sean mm. the, with the green hair. I think that's who it was. That's not him, but I know you're talking about. Yeah. Oh. Um, Louis Galdino, I think his name was. I, see. I don't know if he's still in UFC. And uh, there's another one that you definitely know. One of the guys that was on The Ultimate Fighter in the later seasons, He was on. he's from Tyree Shulman. I fought... I fought a couple of Tiger Shulman guys. One of them is uh, now a, 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 a judge in New Jersey for the UFC, David Torelli. Mm. I retired him because we had, uh, we had two matches. The first match, I broke his nose so bad they had to stop the fight. The second match, he broke my nose. Didn't stop the fight, but he won a decision. And then instead of having a rubber match, he retired. Huh. We'll get you next time, Torelli. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, you long still... story short, um, I came up in Kung Fu. You know, that's where I learned about Chi and all that. And uh, my teacher, Mike Torella, he, he wanted to be Tiger Shulman for the money, uh, the Kung Fu version. And he uh, he ended up starting a company called I Love Kickboxing.com, which is now a nationwide franchise, and he's a millionaire. I've heard of that on Twitter. Apparently, wasn't any money in uh, Kung Fu. I, um, so, the, way that, the way that Ultimate Fighter had me believing it was that your box, your base was boxing. Is that not true? My base was. Jeet Kune Do kickboxing. Mm. So I uh, I kept the brown belt in Kung Fu. And this was uh, when I was 18. I got my brown belt and I was working at the, the uh, academy and teaching, uh, te- you know, teaching, uh, assisting, assisting teaching. And What happened was I was in a, a an all boys Catholic school here on Long Island, and we got out a month early as seniors. And for that month, we just every day barbecued and drank beers. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good time. And that lifestyle continued because. Everybody went away to school and I had a a partial scholarship to an art school locally and I wanted to stay with my Kung Fu school. So I ended up dropping out of Kung Fu, dropping out of 
college because of the depression from alcohol abuse. And I took a year off from martial arts. And then when I came back, I was driving a taxi cab. I drove by a garage, had an awning, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do kickboxing. And it was like a sign. Well, Bruce Lee is the reason why I got into martial arts to begin with. So I walked in the door and that was the gym of Ray Longo, uh, who was a Jeet Kune Do practitioner. He also, I believe, started in Kung Fu. You know, in New York, like I said, we had the, the Chinese uh, influence. But uh, Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee never intended it for it to be a style, which it is now, where if you go to a Jeet Kune Do school, you're going to learn boxing, uh, Muay Thai, trapping from Wing Chun. You're going to learn uh, the Filipino weapon arts and Brazilian jiu-jitsu what Bruce Lee said was basically you train everything and you keep what works for you so you know there's a lot of these different arts they have something valuable for fighting and uh, so the Ji Kune Do gym that I went to was Muay Thai and that was my first fighting was in Muay Thai and um, Ray was one of the first people to bring in the Gracies for seminars. And that's how I believe he met Matt Sarah, who I became a sparring partner for. Yeah. So Matt was getting ready for his fights. And back in those days, it was style versus style, you know, striker versus grappler. And so I was I ended up becoming the striker for his grappling. And I was his major sparring partner for the beginning of his career. Uh, all the way to mostly to to, uh, you know, towards the end of his career. And, um, you know, so I got into MMA through him. To, you know, by learning through him, going to his school and then and getting into the jujitsu. Gotcha. But uh, so I would say. The reason why I had good punching, though, was from baseball. You know, I had overhand punch. That's what I got most of my knockouts with, baseball. And the the stance training of kung fu, which when you go to, to a traditional martial arts school, when you start, you know, it's all about building a solid base, which I think is, is very valuable for personal development, not just fighting. Sure. You know, to get the basics down. Everybody wants to come in the gym and just start sparring. And I see it at the gym that where I'm at now. And I think it's uh, it's lazy training. When I teach, sparring is done once in a while. Not every class or once a week you go in, you put on the the boxing gloves, the shin pads, and a mouthpiece and a cup. And then it's like, you're going to have these mini fights every week. But where is the the thousands and thousands of repetitions on the pads, on the bag, the push-ups, the sit-ups? Everybody, they see ultimate fighting. And ultimate fighting is, is great. That's where I got you know, my name from, and I still practice, but I think what people don't see is what's missing. And that's the, the, the traditional lessons of martial arts training, which is more about personal development, not just to win against somebody else, but to win the, the battle every day. All right. I come from a gym, Luke, um, where my head coach, he talks a lot about um, where he would, I guess, disagree with you on repetition versus sparring because he thinks that sparring is where you learn 
to make things work, you know, like for example, if I were to practice, um, a teep kick 500 times, but I can, you know, I can do it against a bag cause the bag isn't defending or kicking back or anything like that. But if I can learn how to do it, sparring and live against another person, that's going to be better for my teep kick. Do you agree with that? Or what do you think about that? What I would say is that you can hit me with a feather. What do you mean? You can hit me with a feather if your teep kick has never been refined. You can hit me with that all day long. So do you, so like, I guess the way that I interpreted what you were saying though, is you think that, uh, um, do you think sparring is equally as important as, you know, repetition and training that teep kick, for example? So this is over? your teep kick, the blade. If you don't make that blade first, First, you make the blade able to do damage, right? Mm -hmm. And then you learn how to swing it. Right. So you're saying sharpen your tools and then use them. I think sparring is is the last thing, not the first thing. Right. Maybe once a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then all month you go to the videotape and all month you practice what you watched in the videotape. Do you coach any fighters currently? Yes. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm glad you asked that because tomorrow I have Master Luki's League of Champions. So for anybody who is new or newish, what happened was I retired in or I left. I didn't retire. I left UFC in 2009, I think. I was scheduled to fight. A kid from American Top Team. Oh wow! Forgot his name. Uh, he was like a mini version of Luigi Fioravanti, like good boxing and takedowns. Mm -hmm. And he was a brown belt of jiu-jitsu. He probably would beat my ass because <laughs> that was my weakness was getting taken down. Mm -hmm. But you know, I had my kids and. Unbeknownst to me, what I learned later on, I had MTBI, mild traumatic brain injury, from the years of sub-concussive blows. I never got knocked out, but the training, the fighting, uh, it's almost like a cataract building in the brain. And there was a couple of instances where uh, – you know, I believe there was actual injury. For example, when I lost to Jonathan Goulet, he had my head pinned up against the cage like this, and he came down with elbows, three elbows, and my vision went out. And I said to my uh, coach and my girlfriend at the time, ended up being my wife, I don't want to fight anymore. I'm not in the car on the way to the hospital. You know, it was like a self-protection mechanism kicking in. I fought a couple of times after that. But each time it was harder and harder to get in the cage. Because, you know, like I said, martial arts to me is more about personal development than, than beating somebody. So I wanted to do good. I wanted to perform and I wanted to improve and, and win. It's not that I wanted to hurt anybody, but... You know, as the fight got closer and closer, it was like this eerie feeling, which a lot of people, well, nobody talks about, which is the morbidity, the actual, the actual, for lack of a better word, killing that's happening in the cage when somebody spills blood, when somebody gets knocked out. And my last fight, I was fighting, about to go out against Tamden McCrory. And they had this guy taking pictures before and after for a coffee table book. So he got a picture of me. I had my ninja mask on. And the flesh, I didn't realize it was going to be a big flesh. Flesh burned a, burned a hole. I'm seeing like a, a circle. Can't see anything. And I'm getting walked out to the... Uh, uh, the curtain and I hear the crowd 
And I said, they're not cheering for me. They're not cheering against me either. They're cheering for the spectacle. Right. And I got this, this eerie sense that I was walking into, you know, a sacrifice. I was a gladiator and nobody cared about my health. So I left UFC. I spent four months in California with a, a natural healing specialist to heal my brain, learning how to heal my brain. Didn't, didn't happen in four months. It actually took years. They wanted to put me on all type of drugs. If you look up what they do to soldiers who have PTSD and stuff like that, something like 22 different medications. But, you know, I've been doing natural medicine, for example, the chi and all in my special diet and stuff like that. So uh, when I came back, I, I didn't go back to Longo's. I didn't go back to Sarah's. I came back to my parents' house like a kid. But uh, the local place where I went, when I started to do sparring again, even with the headgear, I was starting to get headaches three, four days long. And so I had a guy from uh, Canada connect with me. And the research was coming from hockey that the damage is inside the skull, that the brain hits the inside of the skull. So you can get brain injury from a car accident, you know, it's the whiplash or even wrestling is a, is a, a brain, a sport that has brain injury because of the, the shaking of the head. So here I am since I'm 15. I'm now, this is like 2015, 20, 20, sorry, 2013, 2014. So what's that? 1995 to 2014, 20 years later, right? That's all I know is martial arts. Um, by this point, I'm divorced. Lost custody. Basically homeless. You know, I was living in the gym at one point. When they filmed the uh, Where Are They Now episode. I don't know if you saw that. UFC, Where Are They Now? You could check it out. It goes into a little bit of the beginning of Master Luki's League of Champions. This was in 2014. I was living in the gym. But... Uh, So, uh, yeah, so um, I, I, had no, I, had, I had nothing else. So how do you balance that with, like, UFC and then also, like, the fighter's health? How do you yes. – because, like, like, I'm sure you don't hate the UFC or anything like right. that. Um, yeah. So how do you balance that, like, you know, we want to keep these fighters healthy and protect yes. them, and it's not just a spectacle, but also yes. you need to make money. Yeah, no, it is a spectacle, and um, that could be a good thing. You know, it's a sport. It's entertainment. Uh, it's motivating. People look up to their heroes. Right. And I have my favorite fighters just like everybody. And I, I still watch to study, you know, as a student, see what's, what's working. So what I did was I took out head contact, Wes, and I took out finishes meaning you're not trying to knock the person out to the body you're not trying to kick their knee sideways um you're not trying to break their limbs with submissions i created a scoring system i'm gonna take you inside with me because my dad's working over here i created a scoring system for sparring so there's no head contact there's no finishing. There's padding from head to toe, headgear, chest pad, elbow pad, gloves, you know, knee pads, shin pads. I like to wear the boots. Some people just like the Thai, the Thai style shin pads. And Luke, do you know, do you know what pancreation is? 
Yeah, so the reason why I don't do pancreation is they still do knockouts. Ooh, like liver shots and those kind of... Yeah, you can do knockouts, you can do submissions. In Master Luki's League of Champions, uh, and I got offered to be a part of pancreation. They wanted to, me to help them promote, but I said no. My system is five-minute match, no rounds. Every match is five minutes. You get a score from one to 100 at the end. Eventually, we're going to have an app where you turn your phone sideways. You're watching the action. You're the viewer. You're the scorekeeper. You got a thumb on each side of the, of the screen, and you're going up and down on this uh, little slider, and you're given points. It goes up. It goes down. Every move can get you up to 100 points, whether it's a punch, a kick, a, a, a grapple. And at the end of the five minutes, you know, the algorithm would will formulate a score from one to 100. Tomorrow, we have a five-man tournament. It's going to be live on my YouTube channel. Round robin style. So every guy fights every other guy, five minutes each. No eliminations, no finishing. Every match is five minutes. Every guy is going to get a score from one to 100 at the end of every match. So at the end of the, comes out to 10 matches because the way that, you know, the, you know, everybody fights everybody else comes out to 10 matches. Yeah. Are there, are there headshots? No head contact, no finishing. Oh, that's right. That's right. If you go to masterluki.com, there's more info on it. The okay. first post is for anybody watching, you can, contribute to the operation wounded warrior which is tomorrow is a charity fundraiser so there's no ticket sales everything at the door is donation based the corporate sponsors every fighter's got a corporate sponsor all the money is going to operation wounded warrior that's awesome and it's a league so even though we're probably only going to get maybe a thousand bucks tomorrow because you know it's just me doing it sales is not my specialty but i'm putting in the groundwork every month the first of every month excuse me the first sunday of every month we're going to do it at this location which is the gym that i'm working out of in lynbrook new york on long island and every month i'm going to add a new location so this month it's only going to be one event tomorrow next month the first sunday is going to be this location again the second sunday is going to be a new location i'm connected with a kid in pennsylvania his name is zach meslani he oper- owns and operates uh 10th planet finishers which is a huge facility in pennsylvania and i connected with him last year about me coming down so i'm going to spend a week going all around Pennsylvania to get fighters to participate in another championship there. My goal is to tour, to do what the UFC does. Weston, you know, I I don't want to say like when I first came back from my brain injury, I I just started shitting on everything. I was like, you know, we got to stop head contact. People are going to get hurt. People are getting hurt. You know, people have died, but uh, that just, got me labeled as a maniac right so now my goal is to build something that's going to be a transition for people who are fighters for people who are investors and i believe that touring going around the nation calling people out challenging them when i come to your city i'm going to challenge you to fight me and hopefully go viral and get eyes on the league. Right. If you think about it, how did the UFC get to be uh, not known as a blood sport? How did it become legal? Well, I think they there was a lot of rules and regulations in place from the first UFC when, you know, there was no weight classes. I think that they had uh, 
do a lot of things like adding weight classes and adding certain rules so the quote so the sport could be quote unquote humane if i'm correct right so what they did was they added more rules Mm -hmm. that's all i'm doing right more rules more regulations safer you don't want your kids doing head contact you don't want your kids getting uh knocked out to the body in pancreation you don't want your kids getting their limbs broken in jujitsu tournaments. Even you don't want the kids. Well, this is my opinion, right? You don't want the kid. I don't want the kid to what they do sometimes now is the kid gets in a submission. They'll stop it before any damage can be done. But then the kid lost all his training. Now he's discouraged. People say, Oh, they got to learn the hard way. Believe it or not, the, the research now, uh, in brain science is not it's not confirming that you you learn the hard way the research shows that you learn by encouragement you learn by positive reinforcement sure. you get encouraged when you go to the gym uh you're not you're not going to go back to the gym because you're sore you're going to go back because you you improved you got stronger you look better is is there yeah. any grappling in in uh in your yeah. fighting yeah, so it's full MMA rules, Weston. You get no head contact, no finishing, but knees, elbows. You can even kick a downed opponent in my system because mm. there's no head contact. So you're not going to worry about getting punted in the head. There's just now, no I submissions on the ground or anything. Yes, there's. Okay, so now that's a good question. I couldn't find anybody to fight me tomorrow. I'm going to call out Ryan LaFlair tomorrow. He never got back to me. I'm going to call out another kid. You won't know his name. He never got back to me. You know, I got to kind of do the Conor McGregor thing and, and talk up a big game to try to get people interested. These Ooh, guys I'm, didn't I'm even have to. I'm sorry to cut you off. Are there weight classes? That you're doing? Tomorrow we got uh, five guys. They're all around the same weight class. You know, I want to make this legit. How close? Legit, how you know close? Yeah, I do. How close? We got a, um, weight. We got a 140. He's the lowest, and a 170 is the highest. Okay, so about 30 pounds. Yeah, they're all pretty much close. And the 170 kid, he's not huge. He just has a big butt. Yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't get anybody to fight me, so uh, the only thing I could get was the grappling match. So <clears throat> I call it power hold. So instead of submission, I call it power hold. The way that we're going to do it is <laughs> – you get into a position, could be any position, could be a clinch, could be a, a, a submission. You got a timer now. It's a five minute match, just like the MMA. But, and this, this power hold scoring is applicable in the MMA also. So, not just the points for the striking, but the points for the grappling. You get this kind of like a meter a heart monitor maybe, or like what I was saying with the thumbs, it goes up. Now you get somebody in a move that could be all the way up to the top. Like if it's a a finisher, a rear naked choke, I would give that a hundred points. But the longer you hold that, the longer that meter is going to stay up there. So in the future, this is going to be computerized. But just to give you an idea of how we score it, uh, you can get a, a, somebody in, a, in a, a submission and you can tap out. It's not against the rules as long as you don't injure the person that they can't continue. So that would be the difference between a submission and a finish. A finish means I can't continue. You just lost your sparring partner. That's not smart. So you can tap out. That's important. It's not against the rules. You have to know how to tap out, I believe, to prevent injury. But as the person applying the hold, The longer you hold it, the more points you get. It's potentially something we could do with motion capture cameras where there's such a complicated uh, program that can actually, like what they do in Hollywood with the uh, the 3D uh, capture. It can actually be looking at fighting and putting that onto a scoreboard. I mean, it's kind of futuristic, but... So if you... If theoretically, if you and I were participating in this event tomorrow, mm-hmm. 
Yep. And and you took me down and got me in a rear naked choke. Mm-hmm. You would just hold it and you wouldn't be squeezing. You were just basically showing the scores that, hey, I could choke this guy out right now, but I'm not. Like, that's how you get points then? Yeah, so if I got you down, very small chance of that happening because my takedown sucked. But let's say you fell down. <laughs> say you fell down and you fell down onto your butt and I just kind of scooted behind you. I got you in a rear naked choke. Now, it doesn't even have to be a rear naked choke. It could be in a seatbelt position, right? Yeah. Every The meter is automatically running, Lucas. No matter no matter what you're doing, you're automatically getting points. But the rear naked choke, for example, arm triangle, the regular triangle, um, you know, these things that potentially could kill somebody or put you to sleep, you know, I would give that more points than an arm bar because technically you could fight with a broken arm. You know what I'm saying? So, okay. um, but so let's say rear naked choke, we're getting hundred points, boom, or the meters maxed out. I'm holding that. I'm holding that. I'm scoring. I'm scoring big points, big points. I'm even talking trash in your ear. Oh, you can't even get out. Lucas. <laughs> Come on. I'm going to hold you here. I'm going to hold you here until I decide to. But now at 30 seconds, we're going to get a warning. Because we got to keep the action moving. You know, if you get a guy on top of you, sometimes they know how to hold their weight. You're just stuck in half guard. You're stuck in cross side or whatever. Mm -hmm. So at 30 seconds, the referee, who's going to be mostly most of the time me tomorrow, is going to say, action. You got a third. You got a warning. Now at 45 seconds, if you haven't changed your position, it's going to be a restart. We'll say, oh, you held that for 45 seconds. You could have made him tap out restart if somebody taps out restart but at 30 seconds you get the warning oh now i'm going to transition you transition to a new move and your points get multiplied so now instead of just the points for the the first move you get points to the second move they add it together and then multiply it so you have what's called a, a, a points multiplier so, it's just a way of uh you know scoring sparring that you would normally do at a gym say like uh, you fight a black belt at your school. I'm a purple belt. If I fight a black belt, he could probably tap me out immediately. I'm fighting a brown belt tomorrow. And he's a good brown belt too. But like I said, I couldn't get anybody else. So, you know, it'll, it'll be a good showcase of how you can lose but not get injured. Right. How, you can, how you can do MMA as a real sport, guys. You can have football every week, and that's dangerous. You can have soccer every week. Why can't you have MMA every week? Why can't I do MMA every week? Because I'm going to have to go to the hospital, even if I win. You want your kids to be able to do sports. You want your kids to compete. Um, You want to build, think of it as a brand, the WWE. Do you want to build these superstars? You want to have them in the public eye all the time. Isn't that what UFC is trying to do, build stars? Correct. Do you, so I think I think long term we're looking at the future of the sport. That's what I was going to ask. Where do you see this going long term? Because from what I've, at least from my um, limited understanding, the closest thing I can think of in relation to this is pancreation. But I don't think what you're doing has ever been done before. If I'm correct, right? You're right so, about that. So, what is your end goal? I mean, you want it to be the future of the sport, but do you want it to be more of like a, a training, or do you find it being more of a, this is MMA one day? Yeah, imagine, uh, imagine me. You, you guys remember Pride? Yes, Pride FC. Pride. Yeah. Okay, you know Antonio Inoki. Yeah. You remember yeah. when they had the New Year's celebration, and he comes in on a on a parachute with a fan. Here I come down into a stadium in Japan. You have the world, the Japanese mixed martial arts championships. Over a whole year, we have these uh, weekly events. <clears throat> Your score is being compounded. You have a worldwide database a high score champion of the whole world or of a whole nation. And then we have the Olympics. That'd be, that'd be interesting. I know, 
I know the Olympics right now, they're trying to, um, or I know that there's the league gamma, if you're familiar, G A M M A, um, Mm -hmm. where they're trying to get, um, mixed martial arts into the Olympics, but they're not there yet. This sounds like something that the Olympics would possibly be open to because it's not as dangerous as mixed martial arts. That's this very interesting. Thank you. I think, uh, I think you're right because imagine all the training and all the competitions that it takes for somebody to get to the Olympics. You can never do that in MMA. Your body would never be able to handle that. You know, the people are people barely even fighting, you know, once a year sometimes. Well, I know gamma, um, there's no head contact. So it's, I, I think it's more of like a glorified pancreation, but like you were saying, if it goes to the ground, you can still get an arm broken, leg broken, or where you can't yeah. compete for another, I don't know, six months to a year, whatever the injury may be. Mm-hmm. What, um, with, with, what's the name of this event? I apologize. Yeah, no, it's cool, man. I mean, it's, uh, it's still kind of underground, bro. I, uh, like you said, I'm the only one doing it. I'm not a natural salesman, although I'm, I'm applying my determination that I developed in, in martial arts. And I will, I will become a, a good business person, but we're, we're in the really early stages. This is our first event back since COVID lockdowns. So, you know, I've done about 10 shows in the past. Nice. The most I ever got was uh, a $1,500 prize pot. So basically you have at the end of a tournament, you have each guy has a score, which is the score of all their matches put together. They had four, they had uh, four matches, five man tournament. Each guy has four matches. Now they have, you know, say they got a 60, a 70, you know, 55, 70, whatever they got their personal score. And then you have the total tournament score, which is everyone's score put together. So the personal score divided by the tournament score is a fraction of the prize pot. Okay. So they get paid. They got paid based on their score. Everybody got paid. It wasn't just you win, you get double, you lose, you get half. That's it was cool. basically they get paid based on how they performed, you know, their action. Right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I think that's really cool. That's um, um, how many States have you done this in? Just, just New York. Yeah. Just New York so far. I'm looking at, hopefully Pennsylvania next month uh, in June. This wouldn't even have to be sanctioned as far as I would assume, right? If you have insurance in your gym for sparring and you're doing head contact, this is safer. Yeah. My, yeah. Um, I know that the gym that I go to, they, uh, they host pancreation events and they're very anti head contact. I think, um, in Wisconsin anyway, there's not a ton of mixed martial arts events. So a lot of fighters are participating in pancreation events or other events that may not be there that may not be martial arts that may specify on one martial art. If you know what I mean? Like they're not doing yeah. martial arts, they're just doing Muay Thai tournaments because they can't. Right. Get into, I think Wisconsin, I think that people would really enjoy that. We're, we're trying to get a pancreation tournaments here. If you ever bring it to Wisconsin. I'm, I'm okay. coming. Yeah, I would, I would love to participate. And look, I, I can only be in one place at, at a time. So sure. I'll come through and set you up. Yeah, if you come through, let me know. I, w- I would love to participate in that. That sounds really cool. I'm saying you're going to be co-promoter, bro. I'm down. Let because me know. eventually, like, if what I envision happens, you have a, a, a camera or some type of way to get the scores to a database, mm-hmm. you know? So we'll see. Yeah, let yeah. us let us uh, know the next one. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like when you're training. You know, you you get one percent better every day or whatever. Yeah. Right. You know, I want to go viral, so we'll see if that happens. But if not, I'm gonna keep grinding. Uh, tomorrow is uh, you know, it's for a good cause. I I'm lucky that I got only got an MTBI, but they don't, they're not going to tell you about what happens to a fighter after he, uh, you know, after he leaves the sport right. because, you know, that's not good for business. Mm-hmm. That's why even guys in football, they're trying to get in, get the money and get out. But that's not to me. That's not what, what fighting is about. Fighting is, is 
the actual word fighting, it means you stay there. You don't run. You know, I'm not trying to anymore. I'm not trying to, to shit on UFC. I just I want to fix it. Right. But, you know, money talks. So well, you're, I you're, gotta, your thing could be a good thing for like guys that are getting out of UFC and stuff like that. And they, they can still compete. They can still train. They can still do what they love and get paid for it. Right. But they, just without the damage. Yeah, get, get guys that are getting out, guys that are getting in, guys that are in. If I can make it uh, a, a lateral transition for you as a fighter, you're making a certain amount of money on one fight, but you can only fight, you know, once every couple of months. What if you could fight every week? That could add up. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, people make money doing a lot of weird shit, so... Well, I mean, nowadays, what is there? There's like slap fighting and pillow fighting. I don't see why there's not room for your league. Thank you, Lucas. I appreciate the, uh, you know, your time and your podcast. Um, you know, if anybody wants to learn more about uh, anything that I'm talking about, I have uh, basically opened myself up. If you go to masterluki.com, the about page has all my social media my email even my cell phone number and we could get together on a project but i know you guys probably want to hear more stories about the actual ufc so you know we could we could come back circle back around to the league if you want yeah no for sure. i i was actually um i kind of wrote a list of things i wanted to talk about and um i know that you're promoting this so this is something that i definitely wanted to talk about it sounded uh, very interesting and very appealing to me so i'm happy that we got to uh get into it early and we got to ask some questions about it it sounds very interesting very intriguing and not only would i like to participate in it uh eventually but you know if co-promoting or helping you get a big oh, yeah. possibility i would love to help you yeah man, look i'm like i'm like a monk i i live a simple life you know I, i'm not trying to get rich uh, uh although that's where the money is in fighting is the promoting mm -hmm. um so I believe that this is something, you know, I even looked into, and I still might, I even looked into making a, a nonprofit organization so I could get the government grants, you know, just uh, something that's good for the people wherever I go. Like, some, you know, I'm talking to people online. They live in uh, poor areas. They need stimulus. You know, they need something that can, can bring money to the area. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think I think it's um, a very cool thing. And I'm not just saying it just because you're on the podcast. I actually am very interested and in I think it's really cool. Yeah, you know, I'm a martial artist like you, bro. I'm, I'm a regular guy like you. And, and uh, I, I love training. I love uh, sparring, which is like my favorite. You know, I, I, I don't do it as much as other people. Uh, as like we were talking in the beginning, I, I only do it really for me um, once or twice a month. Um, mm -hmm. But um, that's my favorite, you know, my favorite is it's like playing, you know, you play with your best friend. So I know why you think it's a cool idea. It's the same reason why I think it's a cool idea. And, you know, it, I, it came to me. It's not something where I'm like, oh, I'm, I invented this. I did kind of, but it was more out of necessity because I had no other choice. Yeah. Um, you were mentioning promotion a little bit earlier. Um, you being on the ultimate fighter definitely doesn't hurt your career. You know, I mean, you were definitely a personality on the ultimate fighter. And I think that you being such a personality and you staying in the public eye is going to help you, um, promote this as well. Has that, you know, have you found that it's helping you at all, your ultimate fighter experience and your UFC experience? Well, got me on your show for sure. For sure. All right. <laughs> uh yeah the the uh the thing in with fighting is like you're only as good as your last fight so um you know I, for me it's a challenge to kind of come out of my shell and for example tomorrow i'm gonna i'm gonna be on the mic i'm the i'm the announcer you know i'm the ref i'm fighting um uh, you know i'm gonna be also calling people out i'm gonna have to yell I'm going to have to yell loud and that's not natural for me. I, I'm taking singing lessons and just to be able to like actually use my voice. They used to call me the silent assassin, Lucas. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> right? Was that in the UFC? That was, that was my code name before, um, 
what's his name? Vincente Luque. He took my code name. <laughs> Get you. <laughs> Let's uh, circle back to the ultimate fighter. How was that experience and everything like that in your UFC career and stuff like that? Just kind of sum, I guess, sum those two up or however you want to say okay. it. So as a martial artist, Tough 2 was one of the best things that ever happened to me as a fighter. I'll tell you why. Everyday training, top-of-the-line facility, world-class coaches. I still do things today that I learned from Peter Welch, the boxing coach out of Boston for Marcus Davis and Ken Flo. Uh, what was the other guy? Mark Lehman, mm-hmm. uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, trainer of Joe Stevenson, uh, Mayhem Monkey. Um, what's his name? Uh, Ganya Fairtex. They don't make ties that big, but he was about six, three hundred and close to 200 pounds. I still do things from those guys. You know, it was just, it was like boot camp for MMA. Yeah. Matt Hughes, I don't do too much that he showed because uh, he's a lot of wrestling. He, no, not that. I mean, I love wrestling. I, I'll, as bad as I am, it's something that I practice a lot. It's just that uh, when I was young, I was doing soccer. I was doing comic books. So I got strong legs, but my upper body is relatively weak in comparison. That's something that I'll either have to do steroids, which I never touched, or go back in time. And as I'm growing into my adult body, wrestle then. You know, it's, it's, like, a, it's like you ever heard the saying, country strong. Yeah, yeah, you know, or or construction strength. It's something like as your body is developing, it's growing into this strength. And I'm 42 now, so I can't play catch up. My wrestling is always going to be my weak point. But I love I love wrestling. I love jujitsu. I love everything about mixed martial arts. I don't like to do striking by itself because you know it's limiting. I'm an artist. I like to be able to be free, and I go for takedowns. I have a couple that I you know that I go for, and I'm always trying to improve. But Matt Hughes, the reason why I don't do any of his stuff is because um, it was, I would say, um, more attribute based. He does things and he trains. That's like, you ever heard the saying, you you practice, uh, people only like to do what they're good at, Mm -hmm. you know? it's like he had his way of training. So he goes, um, a lot of, a lot of, um, circuit training, which I do. Um, he had this one drill guy on top boxing gloves, guy on bottom in the guard MMA gloves, ground and pound. Dude gave me a concussion. The most dominant, welterweight ground and pound specialist of all time blue belt skinny blue belt vegetarian (laughs) i ended up crying you know people they they said to me like i'm supposed to be proud you made uh, sam morgan cry because i gave him you know i need him in the i elbowed him which kind of like rocked him really bad and then as he dropped down i need him in the face and he got knocked out or knocked down and then um, they didn't really show it on camera. I don't think it looked good. But as he fell down, he was like kind of out. And then I hit him one more time. Like it came down with a hammer fist. They didn't really show that. I don't think it's a good look. Okay. You know, when, you, when you're when you beating somebody who's already out, they don't, you know, they're trying to, to have an image of of the, the sport, the art. So you don't really see that on the cut of the show, me hitting a, a guy who's already unconscious. But people said, oh, yeah, you know, you made him cry. Like, I'm supposed to be proud of that. But it's not because, you know, he was upset. That's actually a sign of concussion. Crying. You look yeah, that you, up. I, I saw that on one of your Instagram posts. It was um, Max Holloway. At, no. Was Tony. It? Tony was, Ferguson. Tony Ferguson. Yeah, he was crying yeah. after one of his losses. And uh, yeah. 
someone commented or your initial post was regarding like this is a sign of concussion and someone commented on that post oh it's not a sign of concussion he's just mad because he lost and then i think you guys kind of got in a conversation about where you were saying yeah. no that's a sign of concussion that's yeah. it seems like something you're very proficient in is head trauma something you're super interested in obviously yeah and i think he actually won that fight believe it or not oh really you know yeah i think he actually won that fight because um Eddie Bravo was like, uh, was in, was grabbing him. I think in the picture he's grabbing him like, Oh yeah, you're awesome. Blah, blah, blah. And he was just like, <sighs> you know, um, <laughs> yeah. because he's, you know, he's, uh, he goes through wars at Tony Ferguson. Yeah. Imagine me versus Tony Ferguson in the league though. Huh? Right. <laughs> Come on. He might what? be retiring soon after Michael Chandler sends him into the shadow realm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was curious um something i wanted to ask you is matt hughes kind of had a bad reputation not bad reputation but at least for me on the as the viewer i kind of saw it kind of like a jerk a little bit like a bully, a bully. yeah right yeah. exactly do you do you, did you see it the same way being there or is that just kind of how he was portrayed on tv yeah uh i mean they can only edit the footage lucas they they can't make you say anything they can't make you behave a certain way you know they ask leading questions in the interview room you know they say they want they want to get like the sound bite so they're going to ask you a question which they think is going you're going to give them an answer that they're looking for mm -hmm. um but um i would say you know he's uh also had other people you know say the same thing yeah, I, I try not to talk shit about people. I actually yeah. wanted to go. And if I do talk shit about people, I will talk shit about people. But I, it would be something where it's more like something where it's something that has to do with fighting. Like I would say something like this to Matt Hughes. You sure were quick to do a ground and pound drill. But why didn't you ever do striking sparring with me? You think you could take him? Matt Hughes, he participated in all the, not all, but some of the grappling lessons. He was quick to put on the boxing gloves and ground the pound the shit out of me. But he never participated in the stand-up sparring. Matt Hughes, versus, Matt Hughes versus Luke Kumo stand up sparring. Who are you? Who's yeah, I'll listen in my rule set. I'm not afraid to, to spar anybody. Uh -huh. I actually sparred Tim Sylvia on that show. I don't know if they showed the video footage, but Jeremy Horn was brought in and he's an amazing guy. I love Jeremy Horn. I went out to train with him twice before my fights because. He's such a legend. He's so knowledgeable and he lives in Salt Lake City, which is high altitude. So before two of my fights, I went out there. Uh, the one that I'm thinking of right now was against Jason Von Flew. And we we were on the show together, me and Von Flew. That was my first fight, I think, after the finale. And we were fairly even on the show. He was a better grappler. I was a better striker. But we always kind of like, we're even. But then in the fight, he got tired at the end. And he told me because we took the uh, we took the ambulance together to the hospital. I had like a busted lip and he had a busted head. And he goes, damn, you you didn't get tired. And I think that was from the high altitude training. I think that's why Diego Sanchez is such a savage. That's that um, New Mexico altitude. Yeah. But Jeremy Horn, once a week, he had us doing 12 five-minute rounds in the cage. Looking back, it was kind of stupid because that's how – what's the name? The dude that rolled his ankle on season one, Nate Quarry. It was yeah. like, you know, five, five pairs sparring in the, same, in the same cage at the same time. But I sparred with Jeremy Horn. I sparred with all the guys on the team, and I sparred with Tim Sylvia. And Tim Sylvia, that motherfucker tried to knock me out. I swear to God. <laughs> he he threw a right hand that it made a sound effect going past my head. Like, <laughs> because I did a sidekick on him. And he goes, oh, what are you, Bruce Lee? <laughs> he 
some people yeah, they think that you can only do Muay Thai. <laughs> you can't do any you know it's like you can't they they think if you do a sidekick that's not mma because because he comes from militage fighting systems which was basically wrestling and muay thai okay so they, it's almost like he got offended that i did a sidekick on him and he was very competitive like there's the airdyne uh you know the assault bike and he always had to beat me i, I had really good cardio then and I got it up to a certain speed or whatever. And he got on there and he's like, oh, I got to beat you. I got to beat you. So when I kicked him with the sidekick, he tried to knock me out, that guy. But I sparred with him. I sparred with Randy Couture, who beat me up and down that ring. And I'll spar with Matt Hughes. Uh, he probably doesn't train anymore. I'll spar with Matt Sarah. I'll spar with Anderson Silva, Vita Belfort. I don't care because I'll tell you what, this rule set that I created is the, the safest way. And that's going to be the name of my tour. Now, there should be there should be weight classes. When you roll with somebody that big, even if you're doing jiu-jitsu, you have a higher risk of injury. Yeah. But but um, I'll fight anybody. And, you know, that's probably something that I'm going to have to do to promote going around on this tour, which I'm going to call the safest way. So I think it would be good, actually, for me to spar with different people. How about me versus Ronda Rousey? <laughs> cool. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, be cool. Get me in that arm lock under our armpit. Well, Weston, Weston's actually a division one wrestler. He wrestles at Chattanooga. Maybe he'll have yeah. him there with you. Okay. Yeah. Weston, I don't know, you're a I don't know any, wrestler and you do MMA? I don't do MMA. I've never played around with jujitsu or anything, but oh, I just okay. I just wrestle. But Ooh, it's cool. something I might want to get into afterwards, like after I graduate college and stuff like that. Oh, you still, you guys are young. Holy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you though. How'd you, yeah. how'd you get into MMA? Uh, Doing a podcast and shit. Yeah. Uh, um, I knew Lucas from high school. Um, so we wrestled together in high school. I'd help him out a bunch of uh, wrestling stuff. So we just know each other since high school. He called me up, offered it to me. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm in. Awesome. Yeah. And I you love, guys. Yeah. You know, you in Wisconsin. Yeah, Wisconsin. Yeah, uh, Weston lives in Chattanooga right now. I live in uh, Milwaukee yeah. right now. Do it. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe I'll stop by uh, by New York. That I really that does sound really interesting. I think your league. That's something I, I really want to participate in. Yeah, I'm definitely planning. You know, to tour. We'll see how it all pans out. It's just uh, one step at a time. You know, tomorrow is the first one back since COVID. So although I want to be you know, I want to be a certain place. I got to accept where I'm at now. I got to keep grinding and, uh, you know, get, get eyes on it. So, you know, tomorrow's going to be, if you watch, you guys look on my YouTube channel, it's going to be live. You what know, is your YouTube so, channel? So I'm pretty sure it's master Lukey's L O C. Okay. Gotcha. But yeah. if you just type in hashtag master Lukey, that's probably the only thing that'll come up. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm subscribed you know. to you. I watch your uh, your live casts every now and then. So nice. Yeah, I appreciate it, bro. Yeah, I'm trying cool. to monetize the channel so that when I do go on tour, I could have some way of you know paying for gas and shit like that. For yeah. sure. I don't um, want to have to get an OnlyFans yet. Yeah, <laughs> sell those feet pics or something like that. <laughs> yeah, Luke. Um, what do you not opposed to it though? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll link your OnlyFans in the description down below. <laughs> Oh uh, no, just kidding. Um, Luke, with your um time on the Ultimate Fighter, they kind of portrayed you, I guess. Ah, what did they say? In uh, I, someone called you, uh, you're this season's Joe Stevenson. No, not no, Joe, Diego. Diego Sanchez. Diego. Yeah. yeah. Was that? Did they kind of tell you to like amp up your personality a little bit or act a certain way, or was that because I think you were doing wall sits and everyone yeah. else was gassed and you were just there for thirty minutes and you were. Right just strong mentally tough yeah so it was five minutes it was at the end of the you know evaluation period where we had done just exhausted ourselves and that was at the end so that's why they thought it was impressive but they didn't show you my bench press which was the worst <laughs> um but uh yeah so I, I was good at the wall set but when I, when i was uh brown belt and kung fu training for my black belt one of the things we had to do to get a black belt was an hour long horse stance. Horse stance is basically you hold the lowest part of your squat. 
so I was training since, you know, I was a teenager. I would put on the last hour of a Bruce Lee movie called The Chinese Connection. And at the end of the movie, he, he kills the final boss or whatever, the bad guy. And he, he jumps through this like, uh, like screen, you know, they had to have the paper screens because it was, it was in Japan, you know, like those sliding paper screen doors in Japan. Right. So he jumps through and he's like, ah! and I just, it got me so hyped up. I, I watched the last hour of the movie so that when I'm at the end of my wall, my uh, horse stance and my legs are shaking, I'm like, uh, and then he jumps out and it gave me like energy to right. do it. Um, and I was screaming and my neighbor came over one time. She's like, is everything okay? You know, <laughs> screaming in front of my TV, watch Bruce Lee. Um, so when I, when I interviewed we had to send in a video interview. I was on a website, MMA.TV. They got a website for him. You know, I don't, I'm showing my age. I don't know if anybody goes on forums anymore, but <laughs> you now it's like Reddit. Reddit, I think. Yeah. yeah. So it's similar to Reddit, MMA.TV. They had a post, you know, about season one and how you could get on season two. So I made a video interview and I think they asked Matt, Sarah, if he had anybody, because from what I understand, they wanted to build this cast of characters. So they had the dude from Brazil, George. They had the dude from Hawaii, Anthony. They had a couple of guys from your area or whatever. They had, you know, they wanted people of different ethnicities you know hit all the target markets right. i was supposed to be from what it was from from what it was explained to me or what from what i gathered so what happened was we i'm in the uh i'm in the interview room and i was nervous so i wrote out my speech with the producers and then i had this this bracelet of, they call them Buddha beads, supposedly the tree that the Buddha was meditating under when he achieved enlightenment. And they smell, they have a certain type of smell, Buddha beads. And so it was a cue for me when I got nervous, I would smell that I would get relaxed. So I did my interview, I smelled the thing. Um, you could see the interview on, it's hard to get, they probably are hiding it, but if you can get the actual DVD of season two, it's on the bonus disc. Mm -hmm. And I basically said that my approach to martial arts is my religion. And anybody across the cage from me, I was going to wage a holy war on them. And Dana White came through, you know how like uh, in a hotel, you have that door that connects the rooms. Yeah. So Dana White comes through the door and in the other room next to where I was sitting with the producers was a table with all the, the heads and the guy whose name is Craig Pelligian. He was the executive producer for Spike TV. And he, what he told me was, he goes, uh, I know there's a New York asshole inside. What's it going to take for him to come out? <laughs> you know but it was between me i'm sorry and who, who said that to you dana said that to you this guy was named craig Pelligian. he was oh. the executive producer yeah dana okay. he said something like ragging on me for smelling my buddha beads so it was crazy. <laughs> but it was between me and matt sarah's top student a guy named joe scarola who did end up on a later season of the ultimate fighter but he had really bad performance anxiety, so much so that he would even freak out for a jujitsu tournament. And he was kind of like, if I would compare him to anybody, he would be like Hoist Gracie from 
UFC one, like very limited stand up, you know, really amazing on the ground. I mean, he's a superstar on the ground, but um, terrible striking. And not only that, terrible striking reactions. You know, you could be a bad striker, but if you if you are like flinching, you know, it's going to be even even worse. Some people, you know, they can get good at striking because they just don't give a fuck. Like Chris Weidman. Chris Weidman was a, a diesel wrestler like you, Weston, but he picked up the striking and he loved it. You know, he almost fell in love with it to his detriment. But that's another story. Do you remember um, the first time we talked when I commented on your video? Mm, was it on Twitter? It was on Twitter, yeah. I remember meeting you on Twitter, but what was that? It was the the video of you, the ultimate fighter. You just won your first fight. You were uh, chomping on some pizza, and you said this pizza because uh, just oh, yeah. a little backstory on the on the show. <laughs> you had these super weird eating habits, and not not weird, but just you know healthy yeah. that you found for yourself. Yeah. And after your fight, you won. You just started eating like shit, which everyone's like, "Oh, I thought this guy only eats healthy." Yeah. And you're sitting on the couch eating this pizza, and you're like eating this pizza is like having sex with a fat prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because because. You don't want to tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> like you're embarrassed about it. I, man, the things that I did in my life, Lucas, I, I made so many mistakes. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I just got to put my hand in my head, my head. In my <laughs> but, yeah. So um, back then I was doing kind of like alkaline where Randy Couture, kind of like what Randy Couture did, the alkaline diet. And uh I have since even got more strict than that. I got into a bunch of cleansing, so I don't even cheat. I honestly haven't had a cheat meal in close to 10 years. Jeez. But, uh, yeah, the uh, the casein molecule, which is a protein in dairy, it actually binds to the same receptor sites as opium. It's called a xeno-opiate. It's 40 times weaker than heroin, but it lasts over three days. So pizza was the thing that I went to pizza and ice cream, you know, and I just ate till I couldn't eat anymore and got sick. And after the show had filmed, we had one day before everybody left when the producers took us out to the club to enjoy Vegas mm -hmm. and I was still so sick from binging. I, I ended up in the party bus with Marcus Davis because he's sober now. So he didn't even want to be around the party. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were just, uh, just hanging out on the, on the party bus waiting for everybody else to, to finish up. What does your diet look like nowadays? Like, what is that diet you said? I forgot what yeah. it was. I mean, yeah. So, um, in 2006, I connected with a doctor in New York City, and he's the first scientist in America to use something called phase contrast microscopes, also known as dark and light field microscopy, also known as live blood cell analysis. The current medical establishment is still using stained slides. And you don't have a story when you're looking at pictures. You can only have evidence, but evidence could be misleading. The phase contrast microscopy, you actually put live blood on a slide and you see in real time what's happening. And what he did was refined what was at the time called living food. A lady named Ann Wigmore runs the Hippocrates Institute in Florida. People go down to heal naturally from cancer, heart disease, all type of conditions. They go on this cleansing program. My teacher further refined her menu by using phase contrast microscope live blood cell analysis 
So he went from living food. He saw that certain things that they were using causes the blood to clump. So under a microscope, it's really gorgeous if you can see a healthy red blood cell. It's got this toroidal shape, which is a disc that's kind of thin in the middle. It's not, it's not empty, but it's thin in the middle, and then it kind of balloons out at the side and has an aura, actually has a glow that you can see. Uh, beautiful energy that comes out and it's magnetic so the 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 cells can't touch each other they're supposed to be what's called discrete it's like you try to put two north poles together they stay apart and then this is the idea of uh of chi in the body that the blood and the energy is flowing but when somebody and this is what's what my teacher proved using live blood cell analysis, when somebody eats something that it causes them to lose energy, the, the red blood cells start to clump. They lose their aura. And you, you can read somebody externally. If you ever see somebody, they get pale, you know, they get green when they get sick. This is evidence of what's going on inside. So, he came up with the term life food, one word like Master Luki, life food, L-I-F-E-F-O-O-D. And I became life food certified as a chef, as a coach. I can guide people through a, a particular cleanse, which focuses on not just the menu, but the organs, starting with the liver. The liver is what purifies the blood so that it can then heal the rest of the body in terms of cleansing there's a lot of people doing stuff which is like colon cleansing um they'll do teas uh but if you don't cleanse the liver it's like it's like you have a leak in the ceiling and then you try to like clean the furniture or something you got to fix the leak so that's the menu is life food certified. The, the cleanse that goes along with that is something you can look up liver and gallbladder flushing. Now I'm branding everything. So my teacher, he spent his whole life studying. He's like the greatest of all time in terms of science and, and natural healing. But he passed the torch on to me because I got the name, like you said, from MMA and I'm branding his, not his, but, you know, the, the menu that or the ingredients list that he uh, refined, he, I'm, I'm branding that under Master Luki. So over the past not quite 10 years, I've been, you know, eating a certain way, cleansing and then thinking What's the best way to brand this? So you know, I started with quinoa sushi. Quinoa is a grain, uh, excuse me, it's a pseudo cereal. It's actually not a grain. Difference being a grain comes from a grass. Quinoa comes from a flower. It's actually considered a fruit in botany. It's a complete protein, whereas rice is not as a starch. So you know, I was thinking, oh, what can, what can be a, a recipe that I can promote and turn into a product? The thing with the sushi is it's got to be rolled. So maybe one day I'll have a restaurant, you know, we'll roll it fresh for you. But uh, I went through a bunch of different recipes. I was trying to make pizza, pizza dough, like uh, that one where you, you buy the box, the pizza's already made, you just got to stick it in your oven. I was working with... Um, ice cream i was working with uh pumpkin seed cheese eventually i got to something like a goldfish cracker except bigger that you can make kind of a mini sandwich out of it 
and I call it the Dino Tracks. So I cut it in a shape which somewhat resembles the footprint of a dinosaur. You know, to market it to kids, health food for kids. Yeah. And uh, it's made out of pumpkin seeds. It's made out of sprouted buckwheat, which is another complete pro- plant protein pseudo cereal. Uh, in Russia, they call it kasha. And it's really delicious. It gives it that snap. And uh, that's pretty much what I, uh, you know, I, I've put my men, when I eat, I try to eat something that has dino tracks in it. When I was thinking at the end of last year, 2021, I said, you know, law of attraction. I want to manifest a commercial food product. So let me dedicate myself. All I'm going to do is eat pumpkin seed cheese for a a whole year or until it becomes a successful product. But then, and my brother said he would help me because he's, um, you know, he wants to, he wants to help me and he wants to, you know, get, uh, he's into like computers and stuff. So he's like, all right, you come up with a product. We'll take it to farmer's markets. I'll pay for the, uh, the booth or whatever. But then with the cheese, it had to be refrigerated. So I said, all right, you know what? When I was, when I had my kids, when I was married, um, and one of the things that we started to fight about was the food and the fact that when they would eat, when my sons were being fed unhealthy food, they would get sick. And one of the things was goldfish. I said, all right, this back then, let me make a healthy goldfish cracker. So I went back to it lately. And then, so we got dino tracks coming up and long-term I can't fight forever. So I'm going to transition from martial arts to kind of like health food. So if I could go viral with the League of Champions and have, you know, Master Luki brand health food marketed to, to kids and families, right. that's the goal. Yeah. So, like, if you're ever craving something, like, food-wise, you know, like, what kind of food oh, yeah. are you eating? Oh, I may, I can make anything. You crave something. Like, I was with my girlfriend last night. She said, um, um you know, while you were gone, because we, we broke up for six months. Um, I have sometimes if I don't take care of, if I'm not real strict with my, like my life, my personal lifestyle, if I don't get enough sleep, if I eat too much or if I eat too late at night, like the depression kicks in, you know, the, the symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury is anxiety, depression. There's a whole list, mostly emotional. One of the reasons why I ended up divorced, but, uh, about six months ago, we were training together and, uh, you know, it was one of those bad days and I don't know how, what your situation is, but you know, I've, I've had different relationships and I've learned a lot and, you know, women, they, they respond to strength, they respond to weakness and, you know, it's kind of like a survival mechanism that if you, If you cuck yourself, if you become beta, they're not going to stick around. So she uh, she left the gym that day. She thought I didn't want to train with her and me being stubborn and a little bit schizo. I thought her leaving was a sign that she didn't want me anymore. She maybe found somebody else. You know, I'm watching these YouTube videos signs that your girlfriend is cheating on you and you know we basically stopped talking for six months she texted me once or twice i didn't want to be like starting i didn't want to try to beg her back so we stayed apart for six months and then we finally got back together she reached out to me and uh she reached out to me like two weeks ago so now we're back together she told me last night you know when when you were gone i have to be honest uh I, I, uh, I was binge eating cause I was depressed. She claims that, you know, she was alone for six months, which, you know, I want to believe, I don't know that I do, but she said I was binge eating. I said, all right, well, what do you like? I can make it. 
my opinion is just like with MMA, we don't have to throw everything out. You like something, let's just find the healthy alternative. Um, I can make pizza. I can make sushi. I can make ice cream. It's just a matter of translating. Yeah. Does eating so, does eating the way you do help for like weight cuts and you know staying closer to the weight you want to fight at? Yeah, I'm 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 pretty much shredded, man, all year round. I mean, I'm not muscular just because I don't do a lot of um, strength training. To be honest, most of my training is is repping. You know, I practice jujitsu moves, I practice wrestling moves, I practice you know striking moves. At the end of the day, because that's what's important to me mm. is the fighting. So at the end of the day, sometimes I don't have the energy to go and do strength training. It's not like I have a trainer who's 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 training me. You know, it's not like I have uh, a fight. Now I do have a fight tomorrow, so I'm I'm kind of cramming at the last minute. But it's not like somebody is training to technically kill me. So there's not that you know necessity for training but i it's something that i'm working on you know I, I just joined this ufc gym over here so when i actually go to the ufc gym it gives me a little more motivation to to actually do the strength training so i started doing pull-ups more um starting to do shoulder raises because i want to get you know a certain look if i'm promoting a lifestyle i'm saying you know this is a good way to eat i gotta look comparable to somebody who's like a fitness model or something. So I'm trying to build my muscles up. Not that I'm going to be big and big, but, you know, get that pop on top of me being cut. But if you uh, want to cut weight, man, you got to clean up the diet. And uh, if you get to a point where you've cleaned your diet up and there's still, you feel like there's more weight to lose, you get into cleansing. And that's basically pooping <laughs> on your you know i've seen on your instagram talking about your like natural lifestyle and stuff like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the blood of the earth treatment that you use for your mm -hmm. bicep what yeah. what, is, what is blood of the earth blood of the earth is a an untouched soil from the pacific northwest so the concept is this you know you have 50 trillion cells weston you have 500 trillion bacterial cells. You're more bacteria than human. We actually come from the earth. Everything that we're made of, you can find in the earth. The, the cells, the, the components of our cells like mitochondria and things like that. Oh, hold on. One of my fighters is calling me. I'm not going to answer that, but I'll call him back. That's no, all good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, long story short, blood of the earth, untouched soils from hey, the Luke, Pacific Northwest. Luke, sorry, I can't see your face right now. I can just see your, okay. your image. Okay, let me – I don't know what to press. Oh, I see. Hold on a second. Sorry. Gonna... Yeah, sorry to cut you off. There you we're go. Back? Yep, yep, you're all good. We're back. The phone call went, went away. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, Blood of the Earth. Now, oh, shit, he's calling me back. I'll call you back. Oh. Maybe, I'll, maybe I'll call him more. Got you guys. So, basically, we got this soil. It's a full-spectrum probiotic. You can get a probiotic and... You can test it for a certain number of strains. This soil, you can test it, has 50,000 strains of healthy bacteria. Uh, whatever it touches is going to be reduced to its, uh, its, its base level of building blocks. So... What I have going on is a 
for lack of a better word, an inflammation on the back right corner of the heart. And it's pressing on a nerve, which goes all the way down to the middle of my forearm. The, the blood of the earth treatment is this full spectrum probiotic soil in a base of food grade alcohol. I used Bombay Sapphire gin. It's got a few other things in there like baking soda, essential oils, castor oil, and it gets scrubbed into the area, whatever it is. Now I'm doing it on my bicep. I got to get somebody to help me do it on the back, on my back. Cause the, a yoga, I use a yoga hook and it, it did help, but I just can't get that. Like I need somebody to get and put their weight into it because the idea is you scrub this stuff into the, you scrub this liniment into the area. And then you put a deep pressure and that causes the blood from deep to come up into the area and then the blood when it settles it pulls the liniment down to whatever is going on there and it dissolves and it brings whatever area you you're you're working on it brings it back to what's supposed to be there sure. it works on arthritis it works on uh bone spurs it works on tumors it works on um skin it makes you uh you know, more refreshed and it's called the world's m most powerful super vitalizer, this full spectrum probiotic, which is called by my teacher life colloid. And that has to do with the idea that the bacteria is not the smallest form of life there's actually building blocks of bacteria and he calls them life colloid and there's other scientists through the ages that have other names for it uh somatids is one um it's like uh it's like uh you know how everything is comes from nothing in space you have you have uh the idea that you have a black hole and then all of a sudden something coming out of the black hole. And if you do a, an analysis of how many blood cells you have and the rate of mitotic cell division, what you see is that it doesn't match up the idea that blood is made in the bones, in the marrow it doesn't add up. And the truth is that the blood is actually made in the intestine. So life colloid probiotic is also taken internally. And I'm life food certified to help somebody heal, you know, from any condition. So, you know, I, I have a website, masterluki.com has all my contact info. Anybody listening, you want to do natural healing? I can help you, twenty four seven. I don't even charge, man. I'm, I got this. I got this training for free, and I want to pass it on. It's interesting. I have a uh, two shoulder problem. Like both my shoulders are really bad, so I have bone spurs in them, and like our start of our arthritis changes in it. Yeah. So that's interesting stuff. Yeah. So what we do is you scrub the area. You put the deep pressure in there and it might take some time, you know, to, uh, to dissolve it. But my belief and the way that I was trained is that you can heal any condition with no drugs and no surgery. And that's what I'm certified in. I yeah. think, I believe that, you know, the human body is over the billions of years that it took us to get here it's not it's not imperfect right mm -hmm. you know only the only reason why we get sick or whatever is because of uh mistakes and you fix that and it will actually return somewhat to normal 
of course there's something to be said for scarring you know you you make mistakes in life and then you can't take them back yeah i know that all too well but you know don't give up for sure keep fighting and leave good tracks where you go oh yeah leave a good legacy well, Luke, uh, I really want to thank you for coming on the podcast. You, um, ever since I watched season two of The Ultimate Fighter, you uh, were definitely one of my favorite personalities in the uh, in the UFC world and the MMA world. So, for you, for not for you, not only to respond to my tweet and you know follow me back on Instagram, I was like, oh, this is cool. But for me to be able to get to sit down and talk to you for an hour and forty five minutes, like this is awesome dude. I, I really appreciate you coming on and i think your event uh tomorrow um is very cool and i hope you bring it to wisconsin one day because i would love to uh participate in it or just maybe a closer state you know yeah so we'll definitely um stay in touch absolutely you know um just because we did a podcast we're not done lucas <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I hope not. No, yeah, I hope uh, I hope we're not. So, yeah, it was uh, very interesting to be able to uh, pick your brain a little bit, and um, I I definitely would love to work together in the future. For sure, bro. Anytime um, you guys got anything that pops up, like I said, masterluki.com, You click on the about page. You got all my info there to uh, sweet for sure. whatever. Yeah, Sweet. thank you. I appreciate it. And I'll link all your uh, of the YouTube video when I post this. I'll link all your stuff in the, the description down below, so everyone will be able to uh, to see that and get to your website and read and learn more about you. I appreciate it, Lucas. Yeah. I'm Weston, too, bro. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Luke. It was a ton of fun having you on, man. Okay, anytime. Let's do it again then. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to have you on again. We'll do. All right. See you, Luke. See you guys. See you.